Um, welcome everyone to Enlight Lecture on Equity and Education. Um, we have four presentations today, and um, I'm going to be moderating um, this lecture, and I'm also one of the presenters. And um, we have 10, 15 minutes after all the, pre all the speakers have given their presentations for question and answers. So please do you know, drop in the chat or in the Q&A chat uh, any question that you may have. And after all the presentations, we're going to have a time of our final discussion. And also please be reminded of, um, of the networking event uh, after the lecture. Uh, I believe that the link uh, has been shared um, in the registered email. Um, so please uh, join us in the networking event after, after the lecture. And so we're gonna begin with uh, the first presentation and I'll be giving the first presentation uh, this evening. Um, just a bit of introduction about myself. Uh, I'm currently, my name is Sean uh, Adebayo. I'm currently a PhD um, researcher, research supervisor, and teaching assistant at the School of Education, uh, National University of Ireland, Galway. My research, uh, PhD research funded by the Irish Research Council and the Galway Doctoral Research Scholarship explores uh, developing culturally inclusive uh, teaching and learning environments in Irish schools. Um, aside from my research study, I organize uh, workshops on culturally responsive pedagogies for student teachers at NUI Galway. So I'm just gonna share my screen as I speak on the first presentation. Yeah. So um, welcome again, everyone. Uh, so I'll be talking on is equity, equality, and inclusion in education the same? Helping all learners achieve their full potential. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the last few years have been quite challenging uh, for the world and for educators. First, the COVID-19 pandemic shut down the world for a while, and many learning institutions were closed as a result of the pandemic. At the same time, the increasing strength of the anti-racism movement uh, from the United States and across the world has highlighted the importance of equity, inclusion, and equality in education in such a time as this. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent school closure globally led uh, to 1.6 billion children missing out on education, which has further um, amplified the inequalities inherent in many education systems. In many regions around the world, for example, in Europe, uh, groups affected by the COVID-19 pandemic on education may include students of minority migrant background, new language learners, disabled students, and LGBTQ plus students. Uh, my research study on developing uh, culturally inclusive teaching and learning environments in Ireland and beyond has caused me to reflects deeply on the concept of equity, inclusion, and equality in education. Also, my research with student teachers, um, my grandparents, teachers, and educators has further revealed the importance of an understanding that is all the more urgent in the context of the inequalities that will frustrate equitable and quality education for all learners in the era of COVID-19. It is quite challenging to unpack the concepts of equity and equality in education, particularly the differences between these two concepts. However, it is critical for teachers and educators to know the differences between these two concepts to ensure equitable learning for all students, especially in a time of crisis. As you will see on my screen in the left image, everyone is provided with equal support to watch the football game. In the right image, everyone is equipped with differential support that allows equitable access to the game. It should be noted that understanding the differences between equity and equality is not, is not straightforward. It is layered with many complexities. Therefore, the image 
the images on the screen uh, provide um, a basic representation of the differences uh, between equity and equality. So in summary, I argue that equity is based on needs that is responding to students' individual or specific needs in our classrooms to ensure quality teaching and learning. When in contrast, equality is based on fairness, which means being fair to all without acknowledging the additional challenges faced by some. So let me go to the next slide. Many education systems around the world are concerned with the issues of equity and inclusion in policy and practice. However, I believe that more work needs to be done in developing and implementing equity and inclusion policies and practices in education, particularly in the current COVID-19 crisis. Equity can be explained as providing students with personalized support that overcomes potential others such as poverty and minoritized cultural backgrounds. While inclusion in education implies that all students, irrespective of their socioeconomic backgrounds or disabilities, are accepted and fully catered to in mainstream school environments. In other words, Inclusion is all about all students belonging in a classroom. The concept of equity and inclusion in education are not new. Our global education goals have long sought to advance the principles of equity and inclusion in education systems internationally. For example, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, particularly SDG 4, requires countries worldwide to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all learners by 2030. The SDGs were passed in 2015 by UN member states as a holistic approach to ensure that countries around the world achieve equitable and sustainable development in different sectors of society by 2030. However, we see from recent reports by the uh, United Nations Education Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, uh, tasked with tracking the world's progress in achieving SDG 4, presented that it is unlikely for the world to meet the targets of SDG 4 by 2030. Uh, unfortunately, the current humanitarian emergency of COVID-19 has further validated the reality of the findings of these reports, on the impact of the pandemic in achieving the SDGs. So moving forward, uh, teachers and educators can begin to address uh, the issue of equity and inclusion in education by collaborating with colleagues to ensure equitable learning for all students as a way of peer accountability. Secondly, um, Teachers and educators can build better working relationships with students and their guidance or parents. They can commit to continuous professional development programs. Also, constant reflection. I believe that another way teachers can promote equity and inclusion in their classrooms during this COVID-19 pandemic and beyond is to constantly check whether what they are doing enables or empowers the students to help improve them. And lastly, educators must avoid microwave equity. I'm going to talk more about this in the next slide. How to overcome microwave equity. Cornelius Minor, a US-based educator, coined the term microwave equity, which means teachers and educators attempting to achieve equity quickly or overnight. Instead, he wants that the work on equity in education takes time and patience. In his book titled, We Got This, Minor argued that to be equitable and inclusive, teachers and educators need to intentionally listen to kids in, in achieving equity in the classrooms or their students. Needs they need to decentralize power by empowering student voices and do the self-work without blaming students. The push to introduce more equity in education is badly needed, but it comes at a time when teachers and educators are already facing significant challenges 
and additional responsibilities uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, therefore, placing the responsibilities due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, uh, placing the responsibilities for achieving equity and inclusion solely on teachers or educators is quite problematic. Education stakeholders and the entire education system must be involved to make equitable and quality learning for all students a reality, even in the current era of the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, and in several contexts, teachers have not begun to think about uh, equitable teaching because equal education for all is yet to be realized. For example, millions of children, particularly girls, are still out of school in such contexts. As a summary and in, and in conclusion, I will leave us with this quote by Naid Dosani, that equality is giving everyone a shoe. While equity is giving everyone a shoe that fits. Thank you very much. Um, these are my contact details. Um, once again, if you have questions and answers, please do drop them in, in, in the chat and we'll respond after all the presentations. So I'm just gonna go into our second presentation uh, for today. And uh, I'll be inviting Maria, Maria and Nino to, uh, to have the um, slides uh, ready. Uh, so just a brief introduction of our next presenters. Mariana Radstruck studied in the field of coordination of regional and European projects before focusing on gender issues by becoming the reset um, that is redesigning equality and scientific excellence together project coordination manager. She is based at the University of Bordeaux. And the second speaker, Nina Jonka, has a master's degree in political science and gender studies. She is in charge of the implementation of the research project at the University of Bordeaux. So over to you, Maria, Mariana and uh, Nina. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, our presentation today is, uh, has a title, Inequalities in Academic Careers from Master Degree to Tenure, Getting Aware to Prevent Better, as uh, uh, the subject is related to the issues of uh, equality and equity. We will continue with that. Uh, and today with my colleague, Nino, we will try to alternate uh, between our presentations to make it more less monoto mon monotonous and and more dynamic. Uh, at the beginning, we will give you a quick overview of the project and its objectives. Then uh, my colleague will present you gender inequalities in academic careers and the issues related to gender gap. Uh, we will uh, do a quick analysis of the um, uh, difficulties related to scientific excellence and equality. And in the end, we will speak about inequalities and related issues uh, with sexism and uh, sexual sexual violence in at the uh, higher educational institutions. So uh, let's start with uh, RESET. It is a European funded, European Commission funded project and that is, um, uh, that concerns seven research intensive European universities. Uh, they are all labeled as uh, clusters of scientific excellence. Uh, the project lasts for four years. It has a, a European budget and it is now at its second year of uh, functioning. Uh, the next slide will present you the, the map of the partners. So we are placed a bit everywhere in Europe, uh, from Portugal uh, through France and Germany. Uh, Finland, uh, Poland, and uh, Greece. Uh, there is a diversity of partners and diversity of issues. Uh, and uh, the main objectives of the project are to associate scientific excellence policy making with the promotion of occupational equality in academia, where uh, um, excellence driven policy making can reveal itself a bit detrimental to women and uh, to. Um, 
representatives of uh, minorities. Uh, it is uh, primarily but exclu not exclusively designed for, me for women. It means that it considers gender equality and promotion of diversity. They are both uh, equally important for the collective intelligence and uh, are recognized as booster uh, for innovations. Uh, it is uh, the project uh, is um, may, applies two main methods of intersectionality and co-designs and is supposed to um, make a four different type of measures in order to uh, tackle different um, challenges related to gender equality. It is namely training, rethinking of institutional environment and cultural change, inventing new practices and integrating gender equality culture through gender equality plans. Now I will give the floor to my colleague Nino, who will uh, say more about inequalities in Europe and countries. Thank you very much, Marina. So, uh, uh, in fact, when we talk about higher education institutions, uh, it's important to realize that there are still uh, huge gender inequalities. Uh, so here I will first present you some data from the She Figures report that is published uh, once a year uh, and uh, with the uh, more or less 80 indicators. They uh, explain um, the paths of career uh, of women from uh, the PhD degree uh, to uh, all along the career. Um, so we can uh, see that there is almost parity um, in the number of male and female researchers in the European Union, uh, uh, since 48% of researchers are women, but there is still a differentiated distribution between scientific fields. Uh, so here, as you can see, um, uh, in the science and engineering and information and communication um, field, uh, we can see that 75% of researchers are male researchers. Uh, and on the other hand, on the educational science uh, fields, uh, the majority of researchers are female researchers. Uh, so uh, we can observe this in most of our uh, uh, of the countries of uh, the project reset. Uh, some fields are uh, very gender stereotyped, and uh, and it can be also uh, an explanation of gender inequalities. Uh, about the decision making position and. Um, leadership positions. Uh, in this graph, you can see that 76% uh, of the heads of higher education institutions in the European Union are men, uh, and that even uh, if women account for 42% of academic staff uh, in higher education institutions, they only represent 26% of the more qualified employees, so what we call the category uh, A. Uh, so there are still uh, many inequalities in this access to to decision making positions. Uh, and here you have a quick presentation of the six countries of the reset project. And we can see that there are many differences. Uh, so uh, here you have the percentage of female researchers in the country. As you can see, Portugal has uh, the higher uh, um, sex ratio uh, uh, of women uh, in, uh, among researchers, so 43.7%. And Germany, even if uh, we know that in Germany there are many uh, measures taken from uh, gender equality, uh, many innovative projects and uh, efforts, governmental efforts for equality, uh, there are still inequalities uh, on uh, uh, women researchers. And uh, we can see that uh, very few uh, women uh, start a career uh, in research. Uh, so this graph is to show you an interesting phenomena uh, that is called the leaky pipeline. Uh, so if you uh, if you look um, at the left of the graph, uh, we can see the um, the sex ratio of uh, students in license and master degree. So as you can see at the beginning, until the PhD. Uh, there is a majority of women in, uh, in European Union in general, but uh, from the PhD degree uh, and all along the career, we can see that uh, there is this uh, 
loss uh, of, uh, of number of women. So the sex ratio uh, is inverted. And at the end, in the higher position, so grade A, so that is to say a decision-making position, professors, uh, there is a minority of women and a majority of men. Um, so this is observable in almost all the countries. Uh, and that is why we don't uh, only talk about the glass ceiling, but also about the leaden sky, because it's hard for uh, women, even if they achieve a research career, uh, it's hard to uh, get career advancement. So the career advancement of women is slower than the one of men. Uh, here you have a more specific example in France. So this is an ongoing study, uh, but I thought it was interesting to show you. So it's by a, a researcher from the University of Bordeaux, Pascal Roux, who is working on the publication gap between women and men, uh, because we can explain these differences uh, of career advancement among other by the difference of publication, because as you may know, um, to, to advance in, in a career in research, uh, you have to be uh, recognized at an international level, uh, to be recognized as an excellent researcher, and the majority of, um, of uh, the, the evaluation of a researcher is about bibliometrics and about publication. Uh, and here we can observe that the age of 42 is the age at, in which uh, women uh, publish on average 37% less articles per year than men. Uh, and it's the age at which the male-female productivity gap is maximal. Uh, so we can understand that it can be related to motherhood and uh, to work-life balance issues. But also, for instance, at University of Bordeaux and other universities of the RESET project, we could observe during a diagnosis that that uh, women usually dedicate more time to pedagogical duties and less time to research duties. And after, for the recognition and career advancement, pedagogical duties are uh, often uh, less valued. Um, so uh, here, to give you a, a, a focus on the University of Bordeaux, uh, you can see the sex ratio uh, on staff, academic ad administrative staff, uh, teachers and teachers researchers. So, we have a majority, a large majority of women uh, among administrative personnel uh, at the university and a majority of men among um, the, the teachers, researchers at university. So there is also uh, what we call uh, an horizontal segregation uh, and vertical segregation on uh, the, the career path of uh, men and women. Uh, and just uh, to, to finish about uh, the gender gap, so uh, we can observe at University of Bordeaux, as uh, I already explained with the leaky pipeline, that there is a huge gender gap between master degree and PhD. Uh, so here you can see uh, on the left side that 58% of students in master degree uh, in 2019-2020 were female students, but after uh, about the PhD students, it's only 43% of female. Uh, so women usually uh, are less um, enter less into research careers, uh, and it can be um, uh, a consequence of uh, many elements. But among them, uh, stereotypes. And for instance, uh, some researchers say that when they are at, at a master degree, a teacher will say you can't do a, a PhD a thesis because if you want to have children, you won't be able to to have a, a good uh, career in research. So. Uh, there are some uh, stereotypes uh, that can also prevent women from uh, doing a career in research. Uh, so I will uh, maybe pass this slide to let uh, the, the word to, to Marina. Uh, she will present you uh, main, the main elements on scientific excellence. Yeah, uh, there is a, an element of scientific excellence in the project. Um, we are aiming rather not to criticize the scientific ex excellence, but to analyze it deeper and to, to show that there are maybe other indicators that should be included in the evaluation of uh, researchers in order to be them to be considered as excellent as there are multiple inequalities that are uh, observed, namely with relation to publications, uh, 
you can see at the top of this presentation, it means that uh, uh, there is uh, the, the more you publish, uh, the, the less will be uh, the, the, there will be the decrease in the quality of your books of uh, in the publishing of works. Uh, there will be some uh, sort of selection between of uh, journals. You, you, in order to be excellent, you have, will have to publish mostly in English. Uh, it is also a political decision to fund a project, to fund a publications after, and bibliometrics has its uh, limitations as uh, it doesn't consider a lot of criteria, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, publications don't even uh, put the names of the person, so we are not able to uh, recognize who uh, wrote them. And there is uh, a lot of inequalities related to the preference for male candidates over women for recruitment and promotion. It is uh, the ones uh, are related to the norms of ideal academic and the one uh, that are is not supposed to interrupt uh, its career, which is more related to the traditional masculine career, masculine career paths. There is under evaluation of um, other forms of uh, academic skills, such as teaching, management, professional activities. There are often not evaluated. There is a time pressure, which is uh, also related to career paths and people who are um, often having gatekeeping positions, they can put different types of obstacles in terms of which candidates they want to see at certain positions. And uh, often these people are men, uh, in uh, which leads us to the other effect of homo sociability, uh, where we can see a lot of um, factors related to networking and to the evaluation of skills, uh, the famous one such as Mathilda effect where feminine uh, traits uh, are considered uh, higher than female ones uh, and with, with the same CVs, for example. Uh, then there is uh, also a subject of recruitment of uh, postdoctoral students via informal networks where it is uh, mostly men uh, who take profit of that and uh, women, they benefit more from mentoring and from coaching. Uh, there is also a context of discipline to consider where uh, um, we have to make difference between natural studies, STEM, uh, lab sciences, uh, social sciences, and indicators depend highly on the country where uh, in some countries it will be uh, um, more prestigious to, to publish more and in others it is uh, to, to travel and to study abroad, uh, which leads us to the Western norms, uh, mostly Western norms of meritocracy, where we have uh, rankings of institutions uh, and uh, uh, which um, present uh, some uh, elite, um, ec elitist academia and uh, it goes to the detriment uh, of quality and selectivity becomes one of the main indicators of excellence where it is supposed to be a quality of education and research. Um, international mobility, as I said, uh, it, where is it better to go in order to be recognized as excellent? Is it an English speaking country? How many years are you supposed to take uh, in certain countries? And um, uh, women are less, uh, let's say, less uh, um, in, uh, encouraged to take such trips uh, to do long-term studies abroad because there are main caregivers in families. It is related to their social duties. And uh, it all brings us uh, to the um, uh, effect of, of uh, women to be less recognized uh, Yes, you can pass. Yeah, women to be less recognized at the scientific excellence level, uh, where motherhood is considered to be a, a major issue for uh, uh, prevention uh, of women accessing to uh, the. Um, uh, excellent careers and decision-making positions, and it all leads us to gender blindness, where uh, there is a, a certain movement of, uh, supported by people who don't want to recognize that role.
roles and responsibilities are ascribed or imposed uh, in a special social, cultural, economic and political context, and that such vision can be uh, um, that, uh, and that such vision can uh, not help to transform the society and uh, uh, unequal gender relations. Uh, there are also certain ways to prevent uh, this situation um, and to tackle the challenges. It can be done via assessment of professional qualifications, which will include teaching administration. It will be done also by the enhancement of gender balance within committees and gatekeeping positions. Uh, they can uh, have some uh, gender trainings on bias and stereotypes during recruitment making. Uh, there can be also consideration of uh, time uh, availabilities and some, uh, um, some uh, uh, contribution to the uh, gender patterns and careers and gender gap. Um, it should be done also by open advertisement so that everyone could seize an opportunity and uh, be, um, uh, be and it is possible to apply. And then uh, the final element, it is um, encouraging the diversity and mentoring the women and those who need the support in order to provide more inclusion in the uh, and uh, better adaptability of uh, results of scientific excellence. Uh, that's all. I give the floor to Nino again. Yes, thank you, Marina. So uh, now I will uh, present quickly uh, maybe main elements on gender-based violence and discrimination uh, that are not uh, specific to higher education institutions or to academia, uh, but we thought it was important because they can be they can have an impact on career and on uh, equality and equity in uh, in research career. Uh, so I won't uh, present all the, the definitions, but if you need at the end uh, in the question and answer uh, uh, discussion, you can ask for more uh, definitions, but but maybe just uh, starting uh, from the point that gender-based violence is based on sexism. So any belief that leads to people being considered inferior because of their sex or that essentially reduces them to the sexual dimension. And it can have a consequence in employment, working, studying conditions or well-being. Um, so uh, I thought uh, this um, um, analysis of uh, gender-based violence at high, higher education institutions in South Africa is very interesting and can be adapted to uh, our European context since uh, gender-based uh, violence uh, are created by uh, other gender inequalities, by a lack of emotional and legal support, um, by uh, cultural norms, uh, stereotypes, by the environment, and by maybe a lack of information that can uh, that can lead to gender-based violence and that can uh, increase gender-based violence. And uh, the issue with that is that. Uh, uh, Despite all the problems, the, the problems that it can uh, it can have on uh, one person, it has a huge impact on uh, their working or uh, studying life, like emotional and psychological consequences, post-traumatic disorder, abuse of substances, decrease of concentration and productivity, and so it can have an influence on career. And uh, so, how to deal with gender-based violence, especially uh, in the context of a university of higher education institutions? Uh, it is very important to report it. So whether you have you testify uh, gender-based violence or you are a victim, if you feel comfortable and you and you feel the need to to report it, uh, there is a, maybe a speci special unit uh, at your uh, university or at your institution, uh, or there are also associations or uh, uh, from the government. Uh, or maybe other associations that can uh, help uh, people who are victim from gender-based violence. Uh, it is important then to ask for help, um, but also to draw awareness. Uh, you can uh, choose uh, some uh, uh, examples, you can give some context. It's important to draw awareness and to get informed uh, with your colleagues, with your friends, with your family. Uh, it's an important topic. Um, and here, um, just to, to finish, maybe to, to show you some examples of good practices that you can adapt uh, at all institutions. So uh, here, for instance, I talk about a laboratory, but it can be uh, in uh, all working uh, or personal environments. For instance, to co-design a charter for equality and diversity uh, in your laboratory, uh, naming a reference for equality, 
uh, drawing awareness with the original content, for instance, uh, this cartoon. Uh, it's also a way to draw people awareness and to, to show that there are some uh, situations that can be problematic and that can lead to gender-based violence. Uh, or adopting a charter for non-sexist communication, because uh, we know that communication is very important for equity and uh, not to, uh, to give uh, stereotypes that will lead also to, to more inequalities. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, also, thank you to Enlight um, to giving us the chance to do this presentation. Uh, here you have all uh, the information about uh, the recent project. Um, and well, thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Nina and Mariana, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, so we're just going to go into, uh, go on to our next uh, speaker, Ana Luisa Lopez Velez. And so, Ana, um, you can uh, have your slides uh, up. Uh, so, just a, a, a brief uh, bow about Ana. Ana has a PhD in education and an MSc in education research from the University of Manchester, United Kingdom. Uh, from 1999 to 2004, she was a consultant at the UNESCO Regional Bureau for Education in Latin America and the Caribbean, where she specialized in inclusive education and educational mm -hmm. innovations. She's a, rese a researcher and lecturer at the Faculty of Education and Sports, Department of Didactic and School uh, of Organization at the University of the Basque Country. She gives lectures on inclusive education, and interculturality in schools. In undergraduate and postgraduate studies, she's also involved in the doctorate program of psychodidactic. Anna, over to you. Thank you, Son. I'm going to share my presentation. <clears throat> Uh, well, good afternoon, and thank you for letting me be part of this of this project. I think it is a very good opportunity for for us to share our research and also our thinking about inclusive education and equality and equity. And I'm going to share you some aspects considering equity in classrooms uh, from the perspective of the practices. Uh, I will be talking about the principles of inclusive education briefly, and then I will explain to you some characteristics of an inclusive class, considering the preliminary findings of the research we have been going through. Mm. Um, if we go through the process of uh, considering diversity and equity in the schools, we might start by talking about the perspective of the individual model where difficulties are defined on the basis of a student's characteristics. And this was the basic uh, principle which uh, based the uh, integration movement of, of education. Uh, we could see that a group of children can be identified as special. These children need a special teaching in order to respond to their problems. It is better that children with similar problems are taught together in a separate uh, location or in the same class, but in, separate, in a separate group. And the rest of the children are normal and can get benefits from the established way of teaching. This is something that we should be overcoming by now, but I think this is something that they still uh, goes on in some schools and in some classes uh, all over the world. Going through the process, we can see that the following uh, view that has been around considering inclusion has been considering curricular model or social model, model where difficulties are defined on the basis of tasks, activities, and school conditions. There, any child can experience difficulties at the school. We also can have moments where uh, we have difficulties to be part of a group or, or to learn because of our personal situation or family situation or academic situation. Such difficulties can shed light on the way teaching can be improved. So if we analyze these difficulties, we could see how as teachers can improve the way we are teaching in our classes and also the way we can organize the class and the resources in order to respond better, to answer better to the students that we have in that particular class. <clears throat> those improvements lead to better learning conditions for all the students, not only for those who are uh, facing more barriers to learning and participation. Uh, but one thing which is really important in this particular movement is that teachers 
need a support uh, when trying to develop the, their own practice because uh, uh, we are normally considering the sub we have been normally considering support uh, from for uh, for a special uh, a specific group of uh, students but in this particular movement or view what we are considering is that the, the support should be done uh, to teachers in order to improve their practices and also in order to make them reflect on their own practices. Basing on this particular model, the following aspect that we need to take into consideration is that the movement has gone a step further. And now the most important thing which are, which are now guaranteeing is the rights uh, of every person, particularly those people who have more special educational, uh, who have uh, special educational needs or who have more difficulties. As we can see in the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and Optional Protocol uh, of the UN uh, in 2006, uh, persons with disability have the right to uh, free and compulsory primary education and secondary education. Uh, they should have access uh, to an inclusive quality and free primary education and secondary education on an equal basis in their own communities. Uh, to achieve this reasonable accommodation should be necessary in order to respond to the individual requirements of each child and the support should be required in order to maximize the academic and social development of every child, uh, uh, considering full inclusion. Uh, we have been going from the individual model towards the social model, model to the rights model in order to guarantee the rights to everybody uh, to have an inclusive education for all. Thus, we are trying to promote, a, a, considering the sustainable development goals, we are trying to promote quality education, gender equality, reduce inequalities, and peace, justice, and strong institutions. They are the main, the main aspects and the main focus of our, of, of our work. The UNESCO movement has also promoted the inclusion and equity in, edu in education uh, as a way of transforming education, the education agenda of every system, considering any forms of exclusion and marginalization, promoting access to participation and learning outcomes, and uh, considering the situation of the most disadvantaged children and, and people not, uh, in order to not, not to let uh, left anyone behind. Thus, what we are trying to do is trying to transform the situation of our schools, of our systems, and of our classes in order to respond better to, to education. We have been going through a literature review, a, a meta-analysis of a literature review uh, of 14 article, articles considering social inclusion and uh, social uh, and academic achievements of students uh, who are taking part in inclusive uh, education or in a special education. As you can see, we have been going through uh, different articles which, has, uh, which have analyzed a, a number of articles considering inclusive education. Uh, one of the limitations is that in some of these articles, uh, we have found a repetition of uh, some of the studies. That's why I'm not summing up all the studies that are here. Uh, the, and we also have the difficulty because we saw that the inclusive education, uh, the definition of inclusive education was not common for all of them. Uh, there are different ways of considering and defining inclusive education. And this was one of the challenges that we have had uh, in order to analyze the data that we found in these articles. Uh, some of the, the main topics that we have found out are social contacts and friendship, social cohesion, social position, social integration, social inclusion, social participation, attitudes of those children with special educational needs or without special educational needs, needs and those are attitudes co uh, considering cognitive, affective and behavioral uh, factors of attitudes. And then we are also uh, analyzing outcomes or achievements for students with special educational needs and those without special educational needs. Not only academic and learning achievements, but also social achievements. Considering the preliminary findings that we have found, that we have been going through, uh, if we talk about social inclusion, we have found positive and neutral find, findings in the, in the analysis of the data. Uh, we have found four key, uh, key themes, uh, which are central to social participation. Those are friendship and relationships, interaction and contacts, perception of the pupil with special needs, and accept, acceptance by classmates. 
these suspects are more significant in primary education. Uh, those negative effects that we have found out are social isolation, social rejection, perceived loneliness, and bullying. Uh, uh, who, uh, but uh, although we are, we have been analyzing those students with special educational needs. Uh, these uh, effects are not only directed to those children, but also to other children who are to, to other children who are in class. Uh, some of the conditions that appear in the in the data, considering enhancing social inclusion, are the following: placement in regular classrooms, particularly if they are if the special educational uh, need children, students are in a small group, is a, non, a small number of children in each class. Uh, intervention strategies to stimulate social interaction, promoting knowledge and understanding about disabilities and their effect in people's life. And also uh, promoting experiences with friends. When there were children who had experiences with friends, family members of people with disabilities, this stimulation of social interaction was uh, faster and better. And also one of the most important strategies is as well informing classmates in advance, creating workplay for interaction among them and social skills training. If we talk about existing resources and peer support, we can see that support uh, is central in some of the articles that we have been going through, particularly for teachers, uh, promoting co-teaching and teaching assistant, the support to improve their, their practice, and also peer support for students with special educational needs, promoting cooperative learning and peer tutoring as some of the, uh, the, the approaches that have uh, promoted academic achievement. Uh, as we can see in our data, positive or net, neutral, achieve, uh, neutral findings have been more significant in primary education because more support is offered. And we found more challenges uh, of managing inclusion successfully in secondary schools. Teacher training is also a topic that appears in the data. And we can see that professional development of teachers is more effective if it is focused on a specific student needs or disabilities instead of uh, giving a training on inclusive education as a general topic. Also, if, they if this uh, training is concentrated on a specific teacher's concerns and the teaching context, in particular classes or in particular school, uh, it promotes, it encourages a change in teacher's practice. And this is more efficient and more changing in the, in the transformation and in the, in the future. But one of the main aspects that have appeared uh, in the articles and the, in the reviews that we have been analyzing is the student voices. As we can see, uh, the students uh, with disabilities, uh, per, uh, they talk about the, their perception level of participation uh, in the schools. Um, uh, it is better if the adult and peer, and, uh, if adults and peers understand their abilities and their needs. Uh, it is more uh, engaging if their level of involvement in decisions about accommodations are made of those students with disabilities. Uh, we can see from the data that the activist use of um, that the, the students with disabilities use actively a variety of strategies to negotiate environmental barriers in order to overcome them. And uh, to promote participation, the quality of the services and policies provided to students with disabilities is central. We can also see that uh, students uh, without and with special educational needs uh, have a variety of ideas of how to improve the strategies of inclusion in classes. As we can see in this table here, uh, those students had many, many ideas about how to improve the situation of their partners in class. Uh, and as you can see, uh, those peer strategies and those strategies perceived in the students are bigger than those uh, explained by the teachers. We can also see that uh, students with disabilities um, show uh, through observing their, their practices in class, through observing the, the way they, they behave in class, show ways of facilitating social inclusion as they try to do, they use different strategies to negotiate this social inclusion and to be part of the group and to be actively part of the group. This is the bibliography we have used to, to present this, and the review have been based on this on this bibliography. The only thing I want to say is thank you again for your participation uh, and also for the, the possibility, opportunity to take part in this in this webinar. This is there, there you can see my email if you want to contact with me. Thank you so much.
Um, thank you so much, Anna. Wonderful presentation. And just to remind us that, um, please, if you have any questions, uh, we can drop them through the chat. And uh, after our final presentation, um, we will respond to the questions. So we'll go into the last but not the least presentation by Maria Refos Ligi. And uh, I'm just gonna you know, introduce our next speaker. Uh, Maria has an LLD in public law and works as a lecturer at the Faculty of Law at Uppsala University in Sweden. Maria's research is focused on education law, human rights, legal theory, and children's rights. Maria is affiliated with the Stockholm University's uh, Child's Rights Center and the Center for Multidisciplinary Research on Religion and Society, as well as the Institute for Education Law at Uppsala University. Over to you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to talk about equity in, uh, in school by drawing from the Swedish regulation against discrimination and degrading treatment of pupils in school. And uh, this is based on my research project uh, about effective ways of preventing uh, degrading treatment in school through legislation. Um, so at first we can just start with um, why uh, the occurrence of uh, abusive treatment in school, uh, prevention and consequences. Uh, so in Sweden, approximately 26% of a total of 4,050 4, children in grades th three to six state that they have been subjected to abusive treatment in schools. And um, um, uh, they, the studies also um, show that the um, percentage of children that feel that they are subjected to uh, abusive treatments and degrading treatment in schools have increased over the past 10 years. And um, to, like the, the reason why it's important to prevent abusive treatments uh, in school is because children who are abused exposed to abuse at school risk not only mental health problem during their school time, but they can have reoccurring mental health problems long after the abuse have ceased and they have uh, finished schools. Um, uh, and uh, sw Swedish studies against like uh, about effective work against violations um, shows that the most effective way of um, preventing uh, uh, degrading treatment is to have um, preventive measures introduced early. Um, I'm also going to um, just briefly discuss the word bullying. In Swedish, we call it mobbing, uh, which have almost the same kind of um, uh, meaning behind it. And in Swedish legislation, we don't use the word uh, bullying or the Swedish equivalent. Um, we use the term degrading treatment uh, when uh, there's no discrimination attached. So in the Swedish Education Act, um, it is stated that degrading treatment is a conduct that without being discriminatory uh, against um, according to the Discrimination Act, violates the dignity of the child or a student. Uh, so we can see that degrading treatment is the basis, but uh, it um, uh, gives exception to discrimination. Uh, so we have degrading treatment according to the Education Act, and we also have discrimination uh, according sorry to- Sorry to interrupt you, Maria. We can only see the first slide. So oh, I think no. it's going to presentation mode, yeah. So oh, um, I thought I'd started presentation mode. So, oh, okay. Uh, 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 how do I solve this? Um, now it's fine. We can we can see it in the presentation mode now. All right, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, so we all we have the discrimination legislation, um, and um, discrimination is um, in Swede Swedish legislation. It's um, tied to specific social areas. Uh, so, for instance, working life, um, but also education. So that's why it's relevant in school. Um, 
with discrimination legislation, which is uh, basically the same in all EU countries, um, since it's based on EU law, um, it's um, it has uh, to do um, with discrimination grounds uh, or uh, grounds for discrimination. Um, so that is um, uh, based on sex, on transgender identity or expression, ethnicity, religion or other belief, uh, disability, sexual orientation or age. Uh, so these are the grounds which kind of um, uh, start the uh, discrimination legislation. Uh, and there are different kinds of discrimination, uh, direct discrimination, indirect discrimination, in inadequate accessibility, harassment, sexual harassment and instructions to discriminate. Uh, so if anything falls under this category, so that it is classified as discrimination, uh, we won't enter the education legislation um, where um, um, where um, we uh, talk about degrading treatment. Um, I hope that you still can follow along with my slides. Uh, I'm getting a bit nervous that uh, they disappear, but Anyway, um, we have this legislation against degrading treatment and against discrimination. So those both uh, laws are active at the same time. Uh, and then, according to Swedish legislation, uh, there, the schools have certain legal responsibilities. Um, uh, they have to have promotion work, uh, which aims to create a safe uh, preschool and school environment and to strengthen respect for everyone's equal value and human rights. And this kind of work needs to be done regardless of uh, if an in incident of uh, um, degrading treatment or discrimination has taken place or not. So uh, in school they have to talk about human rights, they have to talk about everyone's equal values, um, and they have to address it um, often, basically. And then uh, the school has to have preventive uh, work or programs which aims to avert risks of harassment and abusive treatment. Um, and this is basically that uh, the schools need to um, do research on where in the school uh, children are subjected to um, abusive treatment or discrimination. And then they have to uh, take measures to prevent it. And that could be if um, um, like showers of after uh, training in school, for instance, uh, is a, a place where children feel that they are um, exposed to degrading treatment, for instance, there might be a responsibility for the school to um, put up uh, doors, uh, like shout, like uh, curtains or stuff for, for um, children taking a shower. Um, or it could be uh, lights or more teachers available uh, that uh, are present uh, during um, breaks uh, in between classes. And then there's the third um, thing that they have to do is uh, that they have to have uh, do investigation and remedial work if there is a report of a pupil being subjected to discrimination uh, or degrading treatment. And if that is found to be the case, they have to start work with preventing this. And that could be extra teachers, that could be um, uh, like shifting pupils around in the schools to create a safe space for children that are subjected to degrading treatment or discrimination. Um, and uh, how is this uh, compliance assured then? Because we have a lot of rights and a lot of things that the schools has to do uh, to stop uh, degrading treatment and discrimination. And then in Sweden, we have several supervising agencies. Uh, uh, first, first and foremost, the Swedish schools inspectorates uh, that do, um, uh, they, they go to schools and survey uh, the, uh, the way they uh, adhere to the legislation. Uh, but there's also the Children and Pupils Ombudsman, which is um, part of the Swedish Schools Inspectorate, where uh, children can um, 
send in their complaints or the children's parents, which is most often the case. And the children and pupils ombudsman will look at this complaint and do an investigation about what has happened and the school has to respond. And if the, it is found that the uh, child has been subjected to degrading treatment or um, discrimination, um, the school can be made to pay a fine uh, or pay damages. And when it comes to discrimination, which is like I briefly mentioned before, a separate legislation, then uh, it could be that the school has to pay discrimination compensation instead, which is higher since it's kind of um, there are social um, reasons behind why we uh, want to protect against discrimination more than uh, against uh, usual degrading treatment. And then there are different administrative sanctions, which I won't go into um, uh, very closely, but that uh, could be in, in the case of private schools, uh, if they have uh, real uh, problems with degrading treatment or discrimination, there, there can be um, uh, a demand for them to have the revocation of their permit to actually run a school under those terms. It's, I don't think that it actually has happened, but there is a possibility of that. And this kind of leads into a whole discussion about juridification, rightsification and symbol legislation, because in Swedish schools there has been complaints about this kind of broad human rights protection for children and the right to um, not be um, subjected to discrimination or um, degrading treatment. Um, uh, kind of um, disrupts the schools, uh, which is uh, quite the point, but there has been a loud discussion among Swedish teachers that this kind of um, is used in a wrong way. It's abused rather because um, there is uh, the opportunity to kind of do these investigations against the schools and then it is used um, by parents and children not always in the way that it was anticipated um, in schools and also there are studies that show that the part uh, the the children rather that use this kind of um, uh, legal measures uh, are not really the the children that um, that you wanted to protect from weaker kind of socioeconomic uh, groups, um, but rather it's used by parents and children of kind of a higher socioeconomic uh, standing. And it might be used also to push uh, the school to, for instance, set a higher uh, grades for a child. Um, and and it's, it's become kind of a power play or a weapon, it's been argued. Um, and then uh, the term judification and rightsification has been used to describe this. Um, so even though the protection, the legal protection is very wide in the Swedish system against discrimination and degrading treatment, uh, the, it has received pushback these last five years because of the... Um, really um, the unforeseen effects of having this kind of wide um, um, protection. Um, so uh, the final note is that um, in Sweden we have legal provisions aimed at protecting children's rights. Um, and the question is, does it really ensure children's rights in education? Uh, is the law effective? And as I mentioned before, um, the 10 last years, um, the amount of children in Sweden who has reported being uh, subjected to degrading treatment and disc discrimination has increased. And during this time, we have had this legislation and we don't see an, like a downward trend of uh, children being subjected or reporting that they are subjected to degrading treatment, even though we have this legal safeguards that are argued even by teachers to be extreme and disruptive to their profession, basically. So um, that, that is a question if we actually can solve these problems with law as uh, a tool. Um, and that's basically my presentation. Thank you so much. 
Um, excellent. Thank you so much, Maria. And uh, to all our wonderful speakers in today's lecture. So we'll just go into the discussion and uh, we'll respond to questions from um, audience. Uh, so please uh, do use the uh, chat option to drop in your questions. I'm just going to open the chat and see. I think we have a, a few questions and uh, um, and please be reminded that uh, we we may not have time to respond to all the questions adequately, but uh, we have this space uh, to continue the discussion through the networking event. So please use the link um, in the chat uh, to join the networking if you're unable to uh, fully you know, address all the questions. Uh, I think the first question we, we have here is for Nino and Mariana. Um, it's in the chat. I don't know if you've seen it and you would like to respond to the questions. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. So it was about uh, the impact of uh, the COVID crisis on uh, the publication gap. Um, and if there are existing uh, measures to, to prevent it and to, to try to find solutions to this gap. Uh, so just before starting, I would like to uh, explain that uh, in the reset project, we did um, a qualitative and quantitative uh, analysis of uh, our institutions. And that's interesting because we couldn't find a significant impact of the crisis of the COVID crisis into uh, the publication and working life uh, at our universities. But we know that there were some impacts and many articles uh, can explain that. Uh, I think that for the moment, uh, uh, we need to know more about the impact, the real impact and to have more studies and uh, articles on that in order uh, to become a concrete uh, uh, policy and uh, and to result in concrete actions. Uh, so I don't have uh, concrete examples of uh, actions uh, for the moment. But for instance, at University of Bordeaux, um, the members of um, of the the committee board uh, for recruitment are already trained uh, to take into consideration, for instance, when a woman or uh, uh, someone went on parental leave, um, to take this into consideration and not counting in the into the numbers of publications. So they have to count the numbers of publication, but to take into consideration this, um, this uh, break into the career path. So it can be a solution and maybe about the COVID situation, um, taking into consideration uh, uh, the huge impact it could have in our uh, professional and personal lives can be one solution. Uh, Marina, I don't know if you want to add something. Yeah, it, the, the measure uh, that you know was suggesting it is to uh, uh, to make them aware of this bias uh, and their. Uh, the impact of COVID uh, on on the careers and possible impact on publications. That's all. Thank you so much, uh, Marina and Nino, um, for for that great response. And uh, so I'm just going to respond to the question directed. Uh, to me by seeing, uh, I think that's a very good question. I'll say, um, you no know, countries in the global south, um, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, um, still have, you know, millions of uh, students, particular, particularly girls out of school. And sometimes this is, uh, this is a direct result of cultural and social values for example, you have in many cultures in South uh, East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa where girls are not seen as uh, as you know, uh, worthy of getting education or uh, doesn't see as a profitable investment to have girls in school. Uh, so there, it makes it quite challenging to talk about equity when equality has not been achieved in the first instance by having you know both girls and boys in school. So I, I would say um, how this problem can be mitigated. Uh, equity is very much needed uh, in ensuring a, um, quality education for all learners, but uh, we'll have to work with it too, uh, and, uh, driving you know, equality and equity at the same time. So uh, equality, I would say, just being uh, a means to an end, and that end should be equitable education for all learners. Um, so uh, thanks, thanks again for the question. Um, I don't think we have any other uh, question uh, for today, but um, our speakers uh, will be available in the networking session. So I would like to once again um, thank uh, Enlight um, 
for the opportunity uh, for us to present uh, our research studies and to all the wonderful presentations. Um, uh, thank you very much to our speakers. So I uh, hope to see us at the networking event. Thank you.